Hello, everyone. L.C. Holt here, and this is my update for the week of March the 30th, last week of March. Joining me from quarantine, as you can see, is a, is a face <laughs> from the past, uh, Zach Myers. Hello, everyone. I'm not, I'm not sure if anyone can hear me with that damn thing on. Uh, how's it going? Good. <laughs> it's good to have you back on the show. It's been about forever and a day. It has, and I, I've just been super busy out here in the desert, and uh, I feel wonderful being back. Good, good. And, of course, Rebecca Ivey is here That's with right. us again. That's right. Um, the, yo the yoga master. The yoga person, yes. <laughs> who just did a great live concert, if you want to go on uh, Facebook and watch it. Um, Rebecca, that is, uh, during your, your self-isolation. That's right. Today... Today, though, we're going to be talking, the three of us, about the films of M. Night Shyamalan. He's done a lot of films, so we're going to probably have to break this up into two parts. Today, we're going to hit on uh, the high points, I think, the prime of his work, uh, when he first broke out. When we get into part two, it might get a little more depressing. Uh, but today, <laughs> today, we're going to try and uh, work in five of his films, his first five films as a director. Now, that's not counting the first two that he did, because the first two are, are less known. Um, there's one called Praying with Anger, which he made in 1992, which was self-financed, and I think about five people watched it. <laughs> uh, it was a, kind of an auto, semi-autobiographical drama. Was it one of those that they released later when he hit it big, so everybody wanted to go watch it? You know, you never hear anybody talking about praying okay. with it. And maybe because of that title. I'm sorry, the title turns me off. It's really pretentious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, pray I'm, I'm praying with anger. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds great. Um, and then he did another movie in 1998 called Wide Awake, which was a comedy drama that I think about 10 people saw. It had Rosie O'Donnell in it and, um, and Joseph Cross as a little boy. Um, again, not a movie you hear much about. But I'll tell you a movie you heard a lot about was the movie he did right after Wide Awake. And we came out the year after. And it was the big breakout M. Night Shyamalan movie, a movie called The Sixth Sense. Now, in this movie, you know, you probably get to see a lot of M. Night's uh, influences coming to light. Uh, he started out, I should probably say a little bit, he started out uh, as a young man who loved movies, loved Steven Spielberg, um, made Super 8 films. Both of his parents, M. Night's parents, were doctors. Uh, he was born in India in 1970, and he was, but he was raised in Pennsylvania, which is kind of uh, obvious in so much as you can tell most of his movies are set in and around uh, Philadelphia or in the Pennsylvania area, uh, which The Sixth Sense was set in, in Philadelphia. A guy named David Vogel read the script that M. Night wrote for The Sixth Sense, and he bought it for Disney for a, a pretty high amount considering M. Night did not make, had not made his bones yet. Uh, Three million dollars he paid for that script. And the people, the execs at Disney were like, you paid what to who? M. Night what? M. M. Night Shyamalama Ding Dog what? <laughs> um, they were not happy. And they did not see the potential in the sixth sense, I think it's safe to say. So much so that they sold the production rights to a company called Spyglass. They're like, we're not putting up money to produce this. We'll distribute it if you can finally get it produced. Um, and which is what they did. Now, obviously, with the next few films, they changed their tune because mm -hmm. Six Sense would go on to be this enormous hit, Academy Award nominated movie. Uh, one of the people that was, was nominated for an Academy reward from The Sixth Sense was a young man named Haley Joel Osmond, who up until then was only known as Fire Scump's little boy. And the little kid off of Thunder Alley. And Thunder Alley, that's right. <laughs> he had the little 90s blonde bowl yep. cut. That, yep. <laughs> and he, and up, everybody up, had that. Up until then, he was about the size, every movie you saw him in, he was about the size of Billy Barty, like he could just fit yep. in this whole screen here. Um, and he was a, he was a really originally night Shyam, uh, M. Night Shyamalan wanted to have a dark and brooding little boy. 
play the, the kid, the main character, whose name is Cole, in The Sixth Sense. But uh, Haley Joel Osment won him over. Uh, he's not dark and he's not brooding, but he definitely uh, showed a lot of really interesting potential. And he is very good in that movie. I, I mean, for a kid that age and you think, um, you know, wow, that he, he, the way that he controls his breathing and the way that he's so focused and centered and intense with the stuff, you go, well, this kid is really intelligent. And then years later, he turned into a Macy's Day balloon. Have you seen him lately? <laughs> I mean, I will say this, though. He's lost a lot of weight. Because um, when, when they redid the X-Files, Haley Joel mm -hmm. Osment appears on one of the newer seasons of the X-Files when they rebooted it. And he plays a Marine. And you see him in his Marines uniform and like a, uh, and a photograph and you go, there's no way he met the weight requirement. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, would, it would not have taken him at, at, at 285. No way. Um, but anyway, that is just a slight side note. Um, <laughs> Haley, Haley Joel was very, very good in the sixth sense playing Cole is what I'm trying to say. Uh, his mother... Is another really talented actress who's gone on to do great stuff. Hereditary, she she just recently did. Uh, a, a lady named Toni Collette, fantastic actress, played um, Haley Joel's mother, who is wonderful. She also got nominated for an Academy Reward. I just want to say she is, in my opinion, one of the best parts of that movie. She is great, isn't she? Yeah, I mean, you yeah. really buy her as that mother, you know. And one thing I like about M. Night, I mean, I will criticize where I think M. Night deserves it, but I will say so much as, as this. I think that the relationship between the mother and the son in that movie, I really bought that. You know, yeah. that, that the little boy is unusual. He doesn't have any friends. The mother's just trying to be like the kid's one friend because she knows, even though he's trying to hide it, that he doesn't have, nobody likes him. <laughs> And I can kind of see that, I can see that dynamic happening in life, you know? Um, was I bought it you? No, no. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, I wasn't, I wasn't quite that bad off. I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't see uh, dead people. Um, I mean, I saw dead people, but they were alive, you know? We all see dead people, um, but not literal dead people. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about like the design of this movie because M. Night is one of his strong suits, I think, is how he shoots scenes and also how he designs uh, the use of color. You can definitely see his influence with uh, Hitchcock and with Spielberg because his shots, his scenes, uh, the camera angles are very designed. You know, there is a, a real designed quality to his movies, which sometimes I think is a detriment. And sometimes is, is good because uh, that can go either way. Sometimes if it's too designed, it feels a little stiff. Mm -hmm. um, and other times, like I think in The Sixth Sense, it works well. For instance, like the colors. Uh, if you notice The Sixth Sense, it's pretty obvious. The color red is not used at all in the movie except in key places. Sure. And when it, whenever you see the color red, it's used to emphasize something that was touched by the other world somebody from the other side you know um like for instance the balloon at the party that the little boy goes to that leads him up into that little uh, chamber where he gets attacked and you know all the parents are trying to get to him and, and and his shirt is torn his red shirt is torn you know where the uh ghost uh, attacked him um another instance is like the little tent that he makes in his room is red and that's when he first sees the little girl kara uh or kira who comes to him. Um, a lot of red going on with the Bruce Willis character, uh, Malcolm uh, Crow. Dr. Malcolm Crow. It sounds like a, uh, it sounds like a, like a, a Chicago, it sounds like a Chicago Hope character, you know, Dr. Malcolm Crow. <laughs> um, the most obvious thing is his basement door, that the, the handle of his basement door is red. You know, and there's much made in the movie of him trying to get into the basement door, but it seems to be locked. Um, a lot of, uh, also his wife, Anna, Dr. Crow's wife, she's wearing a red shawl at the end when the twist happens. Let me just go ahead and say this right now. These movies are like 20 years old. There are twists in almost all of M. Night's movies, and that may be part of 
why eh, sometimes they don't work for me depending on the movie okay he was kind of became known for this i'm going to ask you guys a question about this do you think that after the 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 uh success of sixth sense that maybe he got in his head that he had to have a twist yes what yes. about that? yeah <clears throat> i yeah i do because i feel like it worked for him and then he kind of just found like that's like his niche you know he he kind of just went with it but i mean i i see in some instant like some cases in some of his movies it, it really works in other cases uh, why doesn't like he stretch. why doesn't he do like the big twist is there's no twist yes <laughs> now that's a unique twist <laughs> Um, Everybody's sitting there like, wait, what happened? <laughs> we were waiting for it because he does it every time. Yeah. And I think that in this particular point of his career, it worked the first couple times. Yeah. But I'll point out as we go on with these films um, where I didn't think they worked in, fil in, in some of the films we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and throw it out there. Why I was saying that was I was saying these are 20-year-old movies, so uh, obviously there's going to be spoilers. You guys probably already know the twists to all these things, but we can't really talk about the movies without talking about the twists, especially when we're doing an M. Night Shyamalan show, uh, The Twist Master. <laughs> you just imagine him doing this. Um, <laughs> But yeah, uh, the twist in the movie, spoilers. By the way, when I was uh, a teenager and I went to see this movie, this fucking twist was spoiled for me. Somebody told me what the ending of this movie was before I went to see it. And so it probably was not as shocking to me as it was to obviously most audiences. But the twist is that Dr. Malcolm Crow, direct from Chicago Hope, is in fact the boy's mentor and he's a ghost. The dun, whole dun, time, dun. yes, dun, dun, dun. the whole time, Haley Joel uh, Cole, pardon me, has been talking to a ghost. Uh, and it, it's interesting because I do think in this movie, unlike some of his other twists, if you go back and watch the thing, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot made of like the doctor's wife. And it seems like they're estranged based on this incident where he was shot in the past. And now their marriage is coming apart and she's not talking to him. And so you, you go, oh, OK, so they're having uh, marital issues. And, but you know, a part of me is thinking, well, why are they having marital issues that he didn't he couldn't control that he got shot by a guy that yeah. broke into his house. But you could go, oh, maybe there was something else in the intervening years, you know, and maybe that was just the start of something. And then when you find out, oh, she doesn't talk to him because she doesn't know that he's there. He's a ghost and he won't admit that he's dead. You go, oh, okay. And then it does make sense. Uh, I think in this case, in The Sixth Sense, the twist makes sense if you go back and look uh, mm -hmm. at earlier scenes. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah? I agree. And I'll tell you, Rebecca is one of the harshest critics of M. Night Shyamalan. I'm not going to lie to you. She's not always a fan. It's safe to but say. But this is the one that I think, it, yeah, you're right. It works, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um uh, and Zach, I assume you agree with that because you like Sixth Sense, right? I, 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 it's one of my favorite movies of his. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I don't like a lot of his films, but it's definitely. I'm personally a huge Bruce Willis fan, and the fact that he's in it, I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna give it two thumbs, just because you can't. Come on, it's Bruce, Bruce Willis. Well, I'm Can glad you, you mentioned that. And you're used to seeing Bruce Willis do all these action movies up to this point, you know, because yeah. he hadn't done a lot of, you know, I mean, he hadn't done his his kid movie yet or. Well, and that's a know. good that's a good thing to point out, because if you do think back at the time, all you really had seen Bruce Willis do other than action was a couple of movies was Moonlighting and like the Tarantino films. Yeah. You know, um. And other than that, <laughs> movies that nobody watched and weren't successful, you know, like Hudson's Hawk or something. Yeah. You know? But uh, but he was known as a. But if you think back, like uh, Sixth Sense was the first movie that brought him out, and people were like, "Wow, look at him! He's acting, and things aren't mm -hmm. blowing up around him." Um, so yeah, it's a good. That's a good point you made. Um, but Zach, you were talking about Bruce Willis. Well, M. Night Shyamalan did more than one movie with Bruce Willis, and we're about to talk about the second one they did together. But before we do that, let's just say that this movie was made on a $40 million budget, 
and it made almost seven hundred million dollars. So that that's what you call the start of a career, right there. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly, people Disney couldn't... is angry. <laughs> Disney is very angry, but Disney made up for it because they were like, "Oh, what do you want to do next? Yes, we'll green light it. Anything." Um, and as I said, Shyamalan was uh, nominated for an Academy Reward for Best uh, Screenplay, along with Tony Collette and uh, Haley Joel Osment. It was the only time up until now, there's always hope that he's been nominated for an Academy Reward. But as you can tell, the way I say reward, that's not necessarily something to brag about. But within the industry, it certainly gives you a certain amount of cred. Now, Unbreakable. The second. Yes. It's a good movie, ain't it, Zach? Oh, man, I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, I do, too. Um, this was the, the second film that uh, M. Night Shyamalan did with Bruce Willis. It is the first in what we now know as the East Rail 177 trilogy, um, which is awesome. <laughs> and when we get into part two, we'll discuss the other two parts of, East Rail, of the East Rail trilogy. Uh, it's called that because the train Bruce Willis's character is riding on is the East Rail 177, and it derails. And the plot of the movie is everybody dies on the train except for David Dunn, played by Willis. And people are, and he's not even scratched. And people are like, how is this? It's what kind of a miracle is this? And but then see, that would happen to Bruce Willis normally. I know. I mean, we are talking he, about Bruce Willis. He's a badass. That's right. Uh, and but I mean, even in in uh, in the Die Hard, you know, he would get a scratch here and there that would bleed, mm -hmm. and, until you got to the later ones when he was really invulnerable, you know. But the good Die Hards, he would like even get a scratch. And this, not a scratch. David Dunn is scratchless. Um, but M Night Shyamalan, he had this idea about originally the idea for a trilogy was to do a superhero story that was like a three part structure. The first movie would be the the uh, well, it was actually going to be one movie. It was going to be like the birth of the superhero in the first act. The second act would be like him fighting supervillains, and the third act would be him fighting the arch nemesis. You know, uh, he he decided that he would rather just do the birth, the origin story, as a whole movie, and that's how you got Unbreakable. Um, Co-starring in this was Samuel L. Jackson as Elijah Price, uh, otherwise known later as Mr. Glass, um, and he is a big part of the, uh, of the twist in Unbreakable, is Mr. Glass. Uh, I should say, they remember how I said Disney paid um, $3 million, a record at the time, for the Six Cent script? Guess how much they paid for this script? Five, count them, five million dollars for that script. Damn and five more million for Shyamalan to direct. A $10 million paycheck on oh, only shit. his second big movie. But you have to keep in mind that the first one was The Sixth Sense. So, you know, it was a big deal at the time. Um, uh, Julianne Moore was going to be an Unbreakable. Few people know this. As the wife, the character that Robin Wright played, David Dunn's wife, Audrey. Um, she, she decided to turn it down at the last minute to go do Hannibal to replace Jodie Foster as Clary Starling. Um, so we got Robin Wright, Jenny, another Forrest Gump reference. That's right. M. Night Shyamalan must have been a fan of Forrest Gump. He must have. He got He's Forrest the same Kid. same casting director. He did, yeah. The only thing we're missing is like M. Night Shyamalan and Tom Hanks together in. Yes. Coronavirus part one. Um, yes. But it's a pretty interesting, again, we go into the design of this movie. They wanted to design it, some of the shots to look like comic book panels. I should also point out that this is after Batman and Robin, but this is just around the time of, it was just before Spider-Man. So superhero movies were in, they didn't really exist. They had existed and they died off. And then they were about to come back here shortly. But so in a way, I guess M. Night Shyamalan was ahead of his time with Unbreakable because it is a superhero movie. It's a mm -hmm. deconstructed superhero movie. It's the idea of what if, because it's like the character Sam Jackson plays. Elijah Price says his whole theory is that comic books are actually based on reality. 
that people like this existed once and that the comic book is like the mythological version of, of those people. So his idea is that there are people in the world that actually have extraordinary powers and he's trying to find them. And he himself is extraordinary in so much as he has a disease that causes his bones to break very easily, hence his name, Mr. Glass. And hence the fact that if you notice in the movie, which goes back to M. Night Shyamalan's design, every time, a lot of times in the movie, when you see Mr. Glass, he's reflected in mirrors. There's a scene where he's a little boy, you see him reflected throughout the entire scene in a television screen. So there's a lot of like tying in Mr. Glass and hint, hint of what's to come. Um, I know, Zach, you were a big fan of Unbreakable, as you said. Oh, yeah. Uh, what was your, what was your, I mean, did you like the whole thing of the birth of the superhero? I did. Um, I grew up, you know, being a huge comic fan and stuff. So the, when I first watched it and stuff, you know, and I, again, big Bruce Willis fan. That's why I actually watched it. Um, I love I love the whole concept of it and um, Sam Jackson's whole character I just fell in love with because I kind of saw myself in him a little bit um, other than the fact that I you know not made a glass <laughs> but uh, but yeah um, I loved the whole movie uh, and I loved what it actually turned into too with the with the other two films and stuff and it just it's great. Yeah, he kicks ass in it. I do look forward to uh, talking about the, the the other films in the East Rail trilogy because I must admit I am actually quite a big fan of the East Rail trilogy. I have um, some reservations about the very end, but we'll save that. Um, tying into that, though, I should say that Bruce Willis's character, as every great superhero does, has a weakness because you can't be entirely That's involved. Right. And his weakness is water. Um, yeah, and I think we'll save that. <laughs> we'll save how that ties into the trilogy for, for the next episode. I just want to say that's the one thing of the story that kind of pissed me off a little bit. But other than that, I love the story. Do you mean his, his weakness being water or what that eventually came to? Uh, the fact that it's water. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Like, You're such a badass. It has yeah. to be water. He can die in a swimming pool, and he almost does in this movie. Um, like the only super the only, per <laughs> the only person that can beat him is freaking Aquaman. What kind of shit is that? <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's true. Or Iceman. He could make the ice and then it melts, and David Dunn and is screwed. How is this hygiene? <laughs> oh, that's a great point. Does David Dunn take showers? I think uh, you may have found a flaw in this otherwise flawless twist uh, or mythology. That was one thing I would, I wondered about. Like, how does he shower? How does he wash his hands when he goes to the bathroom? And maybe he does it very quick, like, like in the poops yard. And peeps all over. He's got poly pee pee hands. And, oh dear. Oh. You know, these are things I think about, but that's just me. <laughs> well, we're, we're gonna well, be able. Rebecca's watching this movie, going, "Oh, how filthy are his hands!" <laughs> <laughs> Don't was... touch those fries, people. <laughs> <laughs> that's how he. That's how he takes down the villain. Is he's like poopy hands and comes out. <laughs> well, now, well, now it would be, you know, the corona. Yeah. Yeah. I should say that that <laughs> Quentin, Taran Quentin Tarantino really loves this movie. And I don't think it's just because his buddy Sam Jackson is in it. Tarantino says that to him, Unbreakable is one of the top 20 movies made in the past 25 years. Um, and it's pretty damn good. I do think it was underrated in its time. Mm -hmm. It was a success. It made like $250 million. But it That's wasn't. Nothing to it was not the sixth sense. And I think mm -hmm. people... I think people, it may have been a little bit of that sophomore syndrome where you go into a movie thinking it's going to be like this and you're like, oh, wait, this is a totally different film. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's comparable to, say, Tarantino when he did Jackie Brown. It wasn't Pulp yeah. Fiction. And people, I think, went in there thinking, oh, this is going to be Pulp Fiction um, and maybe were a little disappointed. I think in hindsight, Unbreakable is really, is really good. Um, I enjoy it. I don't know if it's one of my favorites of his, but I certainly like it a lot better 
than say the next two we're going to talk about. I was going to say, what was um, to come? <laughs> yes. Um, now, I would like to know you guys' opinion. I'm going to start with Zach. Zach, what did you think of a movie called Signs? Oh, man. Um, and you can be honest. If you liked it, you can. I, I actually kind of like it to a degree, but go ahead. See, two things. I'm a big Alien fan, and I'm a big Joaquin Phoenix fan. Uh, other than that, I thought it was a horrendous piece of shit. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it either. I was just kind of like, well, I'll just go watch Close Encounters of the Third Kind. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'll, I don't mean. I'm gonna to, go watch yeah. Fire in the Sky. I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah. I'm gonna give you my opinion of it. I the first time I watched it, I was just kind of like, oh, really? Mm -hmm. That's it. I, I was really underwhelmed. Yeah. Um, I should say a little little backstory. This was a movie that he did starring Mel Gibson before we found out how crazy Mel Gibson was. <laughs> Uh, so we went, oh, it was a, and it was like, I mean, I remember seeing like the trailers all over the place. It was supposed to be like the big thing. Yeah. And I talked to a lot of friends that fl they flocked to this movie was a huge yeah, hit. I remember. And that I, a lot of my friends flocked to it and they came back to me and said, you know, Elsie, you got to watch this movie. You're going to love it. This is an awesome movie. And I went and saw it and I was kind of like, I mean, it's good. It's okay. But, but it's a little I, underwhelming. It was underwhelming for me. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of an interesting trivial note that uh, Clint Eastwood was offered the role of Graham Hess, the role hmm. that Mel Gibson played. Really? Uh, yes. He was the original choice. Hmm. And he decided not to do it so that he could go and uh, direct a film. Um, it would be interesting. Obviously, Joaquin Phoenix would not have been the brother if they had gone that route, or if, or because you know Clint would have had a really younger brother uh -huh. if that was the case. Um, but I, so anyway, we ended up with Mel Gibson. I think Mel Gibson does a good job in the movie. I think Joaquin is really funny. The kids are really good. Uh, this is the movie that gave us the tinfoil hats that people reference all the time. That's where this comes from, is the tinfoil hats that the kids and Joaquin wear in this, in this film. Not it, too it, many people realize that the little boy was Macaulay Culkin's brother. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And uh, the little girl has actually gone on. She was in uh, Little Miss Sunshine. And okay, she, yeah. she's a singer oh, now. Yeah. She's a pop singer. She's also in the Zombieland movies. Oh, uh, yeah. So she's going on. Uh, Abigail Breslin is her name. Uh, and she's really excellent for such a small child in this movie. I mean, this kid is young. And she's very good playing the character of Bo. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the story for Signs. Basically, what you have is you have an Episcopalian priest who is living on a corn farm with his younger brother and his two children. His wife died, as we find out throughout the movie, uh, from a car accident caused by M. Night Shyamalan, literally caused by M. Night Shyamalan, who plays the character of Ray Reddy. M. Night loves to show up in his own <laughs> movies, and it ain't like uh, uh, Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock like, yeah. yeah, Alfred Hitchcock would just walk through. Like M. Night's like, I'm playing a major part in this bitch. Um, I will be Haley Joe. <laughs> right. He's just down on his knees like dwarf. <laughs> but in this movie, he plays the, the guy that, that has the car accident. He's a veterinarian. Uh, there's actually a neat little... I, I watched it again, and I'd never noticed this before. There's a scene early in the movie where Graham... It's like the second or third scene. It's really early. The, little, the dog pees on the, on the, on the um, kitchen floor. Do you remember that? And the little kids say, I think he's sick. And Graham says, we'll take him to Dr. Crawford. And the kids go, well, that's not, he's a human doctor. And Graham's like, oh, he'll be able to help. And then they leave. And it's just a blow off scene. But mm -hmm. then later in the movie, when he goes to M. Night Shyamalan's house, you see that the character, it's, uh, you see the mailbox and it says like Ray Reddy, veterinarian. And I'm like, wow, that's a neat little thing. So in that scene, he was saying, we're not taking him to the vet. Because the vet killed my fucking wife. You know? Uh, I'd, never done, I'd never noticed that before. Because no one ever points mm -hmm. it out. No one ever actually says that. So you kind of have to watch for it. Um, that's one thing about signs I'll give it. Is a couple things you do pick up on in future viewings. 
mm-hmm. uh, that, that I didn't really see before. Some things are right there in your face. Uh, like, you know, obviously the whole idea of the movie is that nothing is happenstance, that everything happens for a reason. And that's the major argument. Uh, there's a scene literally where Mel Gibson and Joaquin Phoenix are sitting on the couch and they have that very, uh, you know, existential discussion mm-hmm. where they say, um, you know, uh, Mel Gibson, Graham Hess, the character says, you know, I used to think that everything was a plan, that God had a plan for all of us. And then after his wife died, he decided that it's all random. Um, and the movie basically makes a case ultimately that things aren't random, that all of these little chance things are tied together and have some greater purpose. And at least for this family, that seems to be true. Uh, as I said, they were corn farmers, and, and crop circles start popping up in the cornfields. The, the titular signs start to pop up. And then you start getting these reports from across the world of, of lights in the sky, of aliens among us. <laughs> so you got to cue the uh, X-Files music. Um, there's a really famous scene that I remember people talked about constantly and I'm, and not unwarranted with, where you see the quote unquote disturbing footage scene. You guys remember that, right? Where, they're, where Joaquin's watching TV and they're like, this footage might be disturbing to some viewers. And it's a little kid's party in Brazil and they, you know, it's handheld and they look down the alley and it holds and great bit of timing. And then this, alien crosses through the frame at the end of the alley and everyone goes bah! did you get that bah! That's mm-hmm. what just like said. that bah! it sounded a little bit like mr bean I don't know what um this was a, again uh, m night seems to like okay has anyone else noticed this m night likes to work with an actor and then decide i'm gonna do another film with that actor yeah. right away yeah <laughs> yep he did it with Bruce Willis. He did it with uh, with Joaquin, because they did this movie, and then the next one we'll discuss. And then he also did it with uh, with another of Rebecca's favorite actresses, Bryce Dallas Howard. We'll get to that shortly. <laughs> Look at that face. Um, uh, but I should say that I, mm. I think. Uh, what did you guys think of Signs? Did you think that it uh, that the whole all the little pieces and it all worked together and swing away, Meryl, swing away? Did it all work for you? It's that, it's not one of my. No, I mean it's just not my favorite. You were just not my favorite. Not he my is favorite. not. He's not going to win you over, is he? No, he's not. I refuse. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Ryan, I, I, uh, Ryan. I said the first, the first two that, that you know, since, since you know. I think Zach just threw me like. Yeah, I'll watch those, but but signs on, it just started getting a little more. I think difficult. Zach, is, Zach is probably about to attack me because I just called him by the wrong name. I'm so sorry. Look at those daggers <laughs> in his eyes. Look at that. Look at that. You're, if you're watching this on video, like I'm about to. He's going to make you disappear. Um, Zach, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I called you by the wrong name. <laughs> I'm going to do the rest of the show like this. Is that a shame? <laughs> um, no, you're good. You're good. So, I, uh... well, it's a very successful movie. Uh, it, it, it made a lot of money. <laughs> And uh, yes. Signs was very successful, too. And uh, should we talk about the village now? You look like Wilfred from Home, Al- from, um, Home Improvement. You have to turn, yeah, Wilson, you have to turn the Wilson. little uh, jack-in-the-box crank, and then I'll boom, pop back up. All right. So that was Signs. Yeah. And we're about get, to hit the one. The one. Uh, there's, a monster, there's a monster outside my window. Can I have a glass of water? <laughs> That was the trailer line. That was the trailer line. And then you remember in the trailer, you saw Mel Gibson's eyes get real wide, but you had to wait for the movie to see what he was looking at. And yeah. it was a skinny looking alien. It was me up on the roof of his house. You'd have, you'd have that look too if your little girl had freaking half glasses of water all over the goddamn house. That little bitch. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
let's talk about the village because Rebecca has been really dying to <laughs> talk about the village. Uh, the village is probably where, like I said, I like signs, but the village is where it went off the rails for me. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think I might just throw this over to Rebecca and let her No, rant. no, 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 it's okay. Well, it's a movie about Johnny Cash and the pianist and <laughs> Opie's daughter, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they should have put they should have put that on the poster. They should have. <clears throat> the pianist, you know, kills Johnny Cash and <laughs> I remember back when this was originally entitled The Woods. Oh, yeah. That was the original title of the village. And I remember back when they were getting ready to make it, it was a huge secrecy around it. We right. saw this together, remember? He's like, no, I don't. But we did. We saw it, this together. In the theater? No, we rented it. We didn't go see oh. it in the theater. We rented it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we watched it because that's when we started going, oh, there's Johnny Cash. Uh, oh, okay. there's, there's the pianist, uh, Opie's kid. <laughs> That's oh, where that man. came from, yes. He's like, yes. I blocked all that out. It's okay. Uh, yeah, I, that I must have been. That was back before I got kicked in the head by the mule. Now I just that's can't right. remember. That's right. Uh, that's right. That's right. That's right. And that's when you discovered how much I hated this one. Because when it was over, I was like, what was that? What did, what did I just waste my life on? Well. That's time you know, I'll never get back. I guess we can. <laughs> I'm let's... sorry. If you like it, that's okay. It just. Well, let me. Twist. Mm -hmm. Let me jump into the story okay. a little bit, and okay. then we'll get into that twist. Um, here's the story. So a bunch of really good actors like William Hurt and Sigourney Weaver and Brendan mm -hmm. Gleeson, they decide to create a village. And Well, they live in a place called Covington Village in the old world, somewhere out in a field. And they have a bunch of children who are quite old, even though I think they're supposed to be younger. They appear to be about 35 or 40. <laughs> And they live in this village, and in, the village is surrounded by woods, and in the woods live those who we do not speak of, a humanoid race of beasts who are held back by a tenuous um, compromise that was made eons ago. They will not venture into the village and eat all of those 40-year-old children if you respect them and their privacy, and you don't, never leave the place and never venture out into the world beyond. That's the basic idea. You probably have noticed that one of my biggest problems with the village is those kids are nearing AARP age. They're exactly. Nearing, I think I think that they're supposed to be younger. You know, I, I think that we're supposed to accept them as being younger. Yeah. But the problem is they all are played by actors who appear to be about 35. Like 40. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think maybe if you had done the movie and cast the kids with, like, Goonies age children, yeah. I think, honestly, I would have liked it better. I would have bought the it. The movie would have also would have appealed to that audience as well. Yes. What do you think about that, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I hated that fucking movie, man. Oh, <laughs> I, I wanted to just like punch my tv after i watched it i okay so it wasn't just me okay no and, and see and i i kind of like adrian brody i think he's an all yeah, right I actor like too. i yeah. just mm, career choices yeah well I'll, I'll say that adrian brody plays a character named noah percy and he is uh mentally um i don't know what's the right word challenge i guess um he's a little slow he's a little on the slow side i think he is supposed to be the eldest of the children and i think now this is what i took from it i think that he knows what the twist is i, I did either of you get that 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 character is slow he may not be able to communicate it but i think he knows what's going on hmm. i didn't i think i was too busy being angry yeah, I was going to say, I was too busy, like, falling asleep halfway through. I guess I was the only one that, I read too much into this. <laughs> I was trying to make too much sense of this. Elsie's yelling at the TV, I get it! I understand <laughs> I you! I, there's, there was a distinct moment in the village when I thought, 
oh no, we're not going down that road, are we? I remember this vividly when I first saw it. Uh, this part I do remember. Rebecca. You remember, you don't remember me being there, but you're. <laughs> no, I do remember it, that there was that there was one moment because remember before the movie came out and everything, there was a lot of build up to what was the twist because everyone knew it was yes. Sh Shyamalan. Oh, yeah. There's gonna be a fucking twist in it. Yeah. But the, the question was, what would the twist be? And I remember they even put out an image. I don't know if anybody else remembers this. I'm sure you can find it. It was a nighttime image of um, the character that uh, Ron Howard's daughter plays, Ivy, walking through a field at night. And behind her, you saw in the sky a large light, like uh, almost like a spotlight coming down on her. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought, oh, is this going to be another Aliens thing? And I think it was maybe used to misguide a little bit, a little PR trick. Um, because the twist is not aliens. I mean, he'd just done that, so it's not aliens. Uh, it's something totally different, and we'll jump on that here in a second. Um, I want to mention a couple other people uh, who were in the cast that uh, who played the children, quote unquote, the old fucking old ass children. Let uh, me guess, uh, Clint Eastwood. <laughs> <laughs> Clint Eastwood and Martin Sheen were the children in this movie. I thought it was John Goodman. <laughs> I would love if John Goodman had been in this movie. I think I would have given it a pass. Because let me tell you, I've given a lot of movies a pass because John Goodman was in it. Uh, <laughs> King it's, Ralph. <laughs> it's, yeah. It starred, as a friend of mine says, Joe Quinn Phoenix. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and uh, he plays a character named Lucius Hunt. And there's another character in it named uh, 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 Ivy. Yeah, Ivy, I've already said, I think. That's Ron Howard's daughter. Mm -hmm. And then there is Judy Greer, uh, one of the, my least favorite actresses of all time, <laughs> plays Ivy's sister. Uh, and then another of my least favorite actors of all time is a, is a guy named Jesse Eisenberg. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love the synchronized <laughs> um, how, how is he? How does he get work? If I mean, do... Do, I mean, if everyone feels like we do, how does he like sell tickets? And they're like, that guy. We want that guy in a movie. Yes, that, that's a good point. What blows my mind about Jesse Eisenberg is he, the only movie that ever made sense to me that he was cast in was the Woody Allen film. Because I go, mm -hmm. well, of course, he's like little Woody Allen. Like, <laughs> I can totally see that. But other than, you know, because that's kind of, he's like a little Woody Allen. And sort of like Woody Allen. And loathed just as much. <laughs> yeah, I would say arguably just as much. Um, but, just like, but just like Woody Allen, Jesse Eisenberg is always Jesse Eisenberg. Yes. Oh, that's true. Whether he's in The Village or, or Cursed or um, Zombieland or even as Lex Luthor. He is Jesse Eisenberg. Um, but anyway, <laughs> you know, look, he's in the movie. We just have All to All star cast of um, people LC loads. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. I really like William Hurt, not personally. Yeah. Well <laughs> And I, I'm not gonna say why I don't like him personally, but you know, as an actor, I think he's a great actor. I'll give him that. Yeah. Sigourney Weaver, as most of you guys know, love her. Mm -hmm. Love her. Not even they could make some of the dialogue in the village work because the village, other than the, the fact that the kids are 40 years old, my biggest problem with the village is the, the stilted dialogue. It's sort of like uh, um, the Star Wars prequels, you know, the actors they had in that and they couldn't make some of that dialogue work. It's very it, stilted and you're just, just kind of going, that's, they're that's usually exactly. entertaining to watch, but this is just painful. You're exactly right. That's a great analogy to make because that's that's what it is. Even great actors can't save some dialogue. And, you know, and it, there are other movies that prove you can do this kind of thing well. The Witch, for instance, mm -hmm. has that old English stilted type thing, but it works. Mm -hmm. Like you just kind of go, yeah, OK, it's in that time period. Also, the old English does not make sense to me. It bothers me about the twist. Why are they speaking Old English? Yes. Because they don't have to. 
that's obviously for the audience's benefit to convince us that it's in the time period when it's supposedly in. Well, maybe, I, I guess one of the adults um, was like, hey, let's talk like this. And maybe that's why it's very stilted and bad. Maybe that's the connection. Maybe what M. Night is trying to say is if modern people, spoilers, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if modern people try to speak in that English, it comes off really badly. Yes, and that's why it was terrible. The dialogue was terrible. It was because, you know, they were pretending and they had no clue what they were doing. And now I'll tell you <laughs> the point in the movie when I watched it and I thought, oh no, we're not going that route, are we? They're in <laughs> all of the older actors are they're called the elders. They are the mothers and fathers of these fifty year old children. I don't know how that works, but and but they all in their living room have in the corner a box that they keep locked. And there are certain shots in the movie when they reference this box and the camera will sort of do a little push in on it and give importance to it. And when they first did that, I thought to myself, and I don't know where this thought came from. I just thought it's going to be modern pictures in that box. And then I thought, I really hope they're not going to go down that road. But sure enough. And VHS tapes. <laughs> Yeah. And again, I don't know where that came from, but uh, that's I, I for, for once I figured out the twist before it happened, like way before it happened and was very disappointed when we discovered that, in fact, the village is not in the 1800s or whatever. It's actually in modern day. Dun, dun, dun. I knew Which that doesn't make sense because <laughs> because why didn't the government like try to swoop down on it like Jonestown? Well, I guess they, I guess they figured they don't have any automatic. Or Waco. They don't have any automatic weapons, and oh. there's a scene in this movie where M Night Shyamalan once again M Night Shyamalan makes an appearance, and this was a scene that was a part of reshoots that they added in, and I guarantee you that the reason they added this scene is is in is because they were afraid people wouldn't understand this twist because if you read the original script. The film was supposed to end when Ivy climbed over the wall and the truck pulled up and she gets into the truck and they drive away, roll credits. Okay. So I guess you're meant to assume she got the medicine and brought it back. When they, they had, they did a reshoot after the fact that added more stuff to the end where you see her in the modern world, getting medicine and taking it back to, um, to we to, see her go on a shopping trip. Yeah. <laughs> And in the scene where she gets the medicine, M. Night Shyamalan makes an appearance. And he sits there and quite literally explains to you that, that oh, that, that, that William Hurt's character owned this and it's a nature reserve. And they made sure that there was a no fly zone over it. And so no planes could go through and this and this. And he's like going down to bullet points of things that the audience might be confused about the twist. He should have just, was it like an Excel PowerPoint? Yes, that should, he should have hit, hit a button and the projector comes onto the wall and the director goes through. Because uh, essentially that's what he does. I'm going to say for me, this is when M. Night Shyamalan's career started going off the rail. <laughs> um, Zach, what do you think? Man, I feel like he was like, man, okay, I made a couple of good films here. I could just pull this one right, right out of my ass. I don't even care. And... I think that's exactly what he did. He pulled it right out of his ass. And that's why the story just is, I don't know. It's not as good as his other films before yeah. it. This is, I think, one of those examples. I think I was alluding to it earlier when I was talking about Sixth Sense, where you can look back and it all makes sense. Sixth Sense does. Mm -hmm. The village does doesn't. not it it does not hold up to that. It, if you look back on the village, there are scenes in there where you go, wait, okay, what? Because the, the monsters that live in the woods, you discover that they're just suits that the elders wear. And that's their way of scaring the children, quote unquote, the 40-year-old children, and keeping them in the village. But um, when you see scenes like, you know, that monsters raid the village, remember that? And they all have to go hide in their bunkers. You see close-ups of the monsters growling and the mouths opening and like smoke coming out of their mouths. And you later on in the movie, you just see these like little plastic masks that they wear and you go, wait a second, didn't that jaw move and didn't like smoke come out of the mouth and it growled and so what was all that about? It doesn't make sense in second viewing, you know? No. 
the way that, say, uh, Sixth Sense or Unbreakable does. Mm -hmm. You go, oh, okay, yeah, okay, that all makes sense. So I have a lot of problems. I think that maybe the village suffered from the I must have a twist syndrome. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. More, more than any of the others. And that might have been why the next film did not go into twists quite as heavily. I think maybe M. Night got a little scared off by the reaction to the twist in the, in the village. Because he hurt like, himself, so he had to lay off the twist for a while. Yeah, that's, he, he, he pulled his back on that last twist. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, uh, <laughs> but pulled back or not, you know, look, the village made a ton of dough. It made a lot of I money. I don't know how. <laughs> $260 million it made, you know. Now, this was the first time that his reviews weren't wonderful. And here's the thing about M. Night Shyamalan. He's really sensitive when it comes to reviews. And never was that so obvious as when he did Lady in the Water, in which he had a character that's played by Bob Balaban, who is a film critic. And he is the most obnoxious, short-sighted, asshole character that you're ever going to meet. And he dies violently. It's not a subtle point M. Night is making. Uh, I think that whole uh, sort of character and stuff was a, a direct response to the village. Uh, and it kind of continued on to films that we're not going to have time to talk about today. But we'll, we will get in a little bit to Lady in the Water. Are you guys familiar with Lady in the Water? Because it's kind of one of his more obscure ones. I remember, yeah, when, yeah. I remember when it came out. I saw the trailers. I think it's been on at the house, like in the background. But, I mean, I'm going to be honest. After the village... Every time there was a movie said by him, I was just like, I'm not going to sit down and watch this. Unless a lot of people are like, you really need to see this kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm just kind of like, oh, God, it's going to be this stupid twist. It doesn't make any sense type yeah. thing. What about you, uh, Zach? Uh, I was like, really, M. Night, this, another shitty movie. This is mm. awful. So, so you did see it. You've seen it all the way through? I, I've seen it a couple times because the first time I watched it, I didn't like it. And a buddy of mine just kept, he loved it for some freaking reason. And he kept telling me, oh, you have to watch it. Just watch it one more time, you know. And, you know, he, he, was, he was that guy. And I watched it again after the movie ended. I was like, this, this oh, gosh. I just remember the trailer, and I was just kind of like. Do you remember Lady in the Water? Yes. They always whispered the title. Yeah, that's what I remember most from the trailer is Lady in the Water. <laughs> um, now, this began as a bedtime story that M. Night told his children. And it, may, it probably should have stayed that way. But he decided to make a movie out of his kid's bedtime story. And the movie has a lot of that strange fantasy, the bluegly block needs to get to the block of the blue and the block of the blue. A lot of that, like, nom nomenclature of these sorts of movies, you know, which if you do it well, it works. But I think if you don't do it well, it can be sort of funny. I'm going to give you a rundown. Guys, just sit back. Okay. Get you a Coca-Cola, and I'm going to tell you a little story. Once upon a time, the magical narf of the undersea blue world provided guidance to humanity. But we've forgotten our relationship with them, bringing us war and strife. Seeing the end of humanity coming, the NARF sent a humanoid creature to humanity. Though most of them sent are destroyed by the evil scrunts, humanity has forgotten how to listen to others, and the NARF is here to help us. So to me, it's like the bloggedy blooks got sent by the bloogity blocks and the narfs and the scrunts and the beakity box and the, oh God, this fucking fantasy shit. I don't, I mean, again, when it works, it works. When it don't, it sounds really silly. <laughs> um, so the narf, the water nymph in question, the, the water nymphomaniac in question is, is Ron Howard's daughter. And her name is Story. Get it? Story. Oh, yes. 
And story comes through the apartment complex swimming pool of a man named Cleveland Heap. I'll say I that again. Hit something. <laughs> I'll say that again. Cleveland Heap <laughs> is the main character. And Cleveland has to help Story. He has to help get Story back to her blue world using the Great Eaton, which is a giant hawk. But he has to protect her from the Scrunts, which is a wolf covered in grass that's coming to kill Story. And in order to get her back, he must decipher who in the apartment complex is the guardian, the symbolist, the guild, and the healer. Sheesh. This sounds like something some person like smoking some wacky weed would come up with in 1968 and try to make an animated film and it just didn't work. I feel like when I was telling that story, I was sitting in the world's worst producer's pitch because you guys were just looking at me like, what the hell are you talking about? I don't think I I don't think I would have sold this pitch to you, judging from your reactions to all that. No. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean it's it's odd. There are eventually you do discover who all these people are. Like the symbolist is the little boy that reads the future off of cereal boxes. I mean, all the ingredients of cereal boxes. Um, the Guardian is a guy who lives in the apartment complex with an abnormally large arm. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just very... Yeah, he has a huge arm. One of his arms is giant and muscular. Why? Who knows? It just is. Uh, Steroids because... gone wrong. <laughs> Scare Steroids were directed dire straight into that arm. I, it's another one of those things where you see M. Night Shyamalan sitting around going, this is, yeah, people are going to like this. This is clever. Um, and he does a lot of that in the neck, in the first movie we're going to talk about in part two, The Happening. He does a lot of that too. It was like he was going through a phase of let's see how weird I can make my characters. Um, I do, I think that the character of Cleveland Heap, the main character that, uh, it's hard to say it, isn't it? It's like it's like talking about that uh, uh, Michael Aspender movie, um, the Snowman, where his his the, his character's name is Harry Hole. It's very hard to talk about that and not laugh. I mean, his character's name is literally Harry Hole in that movie. Well, in this movie, Paul Giamatti's character is Cleveland Heap, and Cleveland Heap has a classic M Night Shyamalan backstory. His family was murdered, and he's trying to deal with the grief of it. And come to find out he is the healer because he has to channel his grief into something positive and he can use it at the right moment to heal story when she's attacked by the scrunt. Uh, <laughs> it's just very, it's hard to say this shit, man. And not, it's, it's very weird. Uh, Disney did not get it. <laughs> Despite all the hundreds of millions of dollars he had made for Disney, he pitched this to them and there was a lady named Nina Jacobson and she was like no no mm -mm. and there was another guy named Dick Cook and he was like I don't get it we, I don't think we're gonna go down this road and Sean yeah, I Lund, agree with Dick yeah, <laughs> you have to deal with grit Dick Dick did not get the scrunts nor the heaps uh, but I will say this I think that M. Night Shyamalan got really pissed when his weird gobbledygook story wasn't accepted by Disney because he ran off, he took his ball and went play somewhere else. And he went over to Warner Brothers. I was going to say he tried to call Don Bluth, but Don Bluth was just like, no. Yeah, I don't think, for some probably based on the success of his previous films, Warner Brothers was like, yeah, we'll give this a, we'll give this a go, Lady in the Water. Lady in the Water. But unfortunately, it just did not. It didn't work. And it's embarrassing how much th this movie got terrible reviews, not just by you guys, but by, you know, <laughs> critics everywhere. Uh, what is it was, its Rotten Tomatoes? What it was it? What is its rating? Did you? I don't know Sometimes what the Rotten like I'm not like sure. Five percent. <laughs> it's probably about negative three, I suppose. Um, is there a zero on Rotten Tomatoes? I believe so. Surely there is some movie that that has like a zero percent. I was too. We should look that up and, and address it uh, some other time. <laughs> but 
Uh, in terms of this movie, the critics did not like it. Audiences clearly did not get it. It cost seventy million dollars to make Lady in the Water, <laughs> and it grossed it grossed seventy two million dollars worldwide. Uh, and again, seventy million dollars not counting marketing, which is probably say. that's probably another twenty five. So, uh, M Night Shyamalan took a right cross right to the old M Night Shyamalan. <laughs> And it was the first time that one of his movies not only underperformed, but flopped big time. And thus began the end of M. Night Shyamalan's original streak. He won, him, he won his way back eventually. And we'll get into that on part two. But before we get into that on part two, we're going to go through a number of really depressing films. Aren't you all excited and looking forward to things like The Happening and The Last Airbender and After Earth? I cannot wait to tell you my opinions on After Earth. Oh. But until then, that's our part one show on M. Night Shyamalan. Um, Rebecca? Yep. Has yep. your opinion of, of Mr. Knight changed at all? No. <laughs> Uh, this hour-long discussion has not brought you around or, or opened any any new doors. No. And Zach, I'm, I'm so good. sorry I messed up your name. <laughs> um, from down below, I have to ask: Is your opinion changed at all of M Night Shyamalan? Well, um, no. <laughs> I I think he's a good director when he um, when he really like. I don't know, puts in the, the proper work. I, I think that he half-fasses a couple of his films. And I say half-fast just because of the fact that, I don't know, when he Mr. made Heap. it. <laughs> yeah, see, that's what I'm, see, come on. You can't really tell me that, like, he put some serious work into that one. Like, Or do you think it's just like he he's he's gotten so big that he just buys his own hype? And you know how people get really, really yeah. big? And then all of a sudden, they can't relate to people anymore. And so the, the, the see, stuff they put out, you're like, what is this? And see, I think it's exactly what it is. When he first start, when he first came out, he really had to, um, you know, he made a couple, he did a couple things that nobody really knew much of. He, when he, when he did, when he did The Sixth Sense, he really, really had to, like, put a lot of work into it. And he put a lot of, I mean, the story's a little deeper it makes a little bit more sense. He picked a little better actors for it. Uh, same with Unbreakable. Um, and then after that, I, it kind of just slowly started going downhill, in my opinion. And I think maybe he stopped taking quite so much time thinking these things through. I could be wrong, but certain things later, in, in the, especially in the films that we're talking about here, like The Village does not seem as thought through as The Sixth Sense or Unbreakable. You know, oh, no, no. It, it just has too many holes in it, too many plot holes. Um, it almost feels like the kind of movie that was totally rewritten and reshot and had that sort of meddling going on, which honestly it didn't. There was the reshoots they did to the very, very end, but that doesn't affect what the twist was or how any, all of that was his original vision. That wasn't meddled with. In fact, his films usually aren't meddled with, so you can't even go with that defense. Um, Maybe he should have just taken a little more time. And uh, when we go into films, like I said, some of the ones I mentioned for part two, um, I think, yeah, you're going to get to see some of M. Night on the loose, unrestrained, <laughs> when he needed to be restrained. And if you notice, lately his films have gotten a lot better, and they yeah. got a lot better because the budgets went way down. I think, yeah. maybe, I think maybe M. Night Shyamalan needs restraint in order to really be, <laughs> you know. But anyway, uh, that's our show, uh, part one of M. Night Shyamalan. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I want to thank Rebecca for joining me, as usual. And Zach, I want you to come back. Please come back. It's been too long. Yeah, dude, for sure. And I, I love doing these shows. They're really fun. Well, hopefully we'll all three be here for our next show. Um, until then, I want you guys to stay healthy out there, be smart and responsible, 
And, take and wash care. your hands. Wash your hands, get your masks on, take care of yourself.